Hello and welcome back to Signals to Danger. We're now up to episode 7, and thanks to everyone who's still here and tuning in, and welcome to all of you who are just starting to listen to the podcast. Let's start today with a couple of announcements, just like we have done previously. First and foremost, in the interests of remaining factual and transparent, I need to apologise for something I said in error in the Hatfield episode. After writing the script for the episode, I blindly read out a typo, and I didn't catch it in post-production. When I was describing factors that the REIB looks at when investigating an accident, I was at one point harping on about casual factors. This was pointed out to me by Heedfan on the Rail UK forum, and I would like to list a correction at this point. Factors which caused the accident are in fact, and of course, causal factors and not casual factors. Secondly, we've now created an opportunity to support the podcast if you want to. We're set up on Patreon, so if you want to help contribute to the costs of creating, hosting, editing software, equipment, etc, etc, you can do. As it stands, there is only a general support option available at the moment, which is £3 a month. I might look at adding some additional reward tiers in the future, pay a bit more, get something special, something different back. But I really want to stress I will not be limiting the content that's available right now to anybody. We'll still be releasing an episode of Fortnite, and they're going to be freely available. But if you can think of ideas for reward tiers going forwards, please get in touch. I'd like to thank our new patron, Julia, for her support. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. If anybody else wants to have a look into it, you can find our page at www.patreon.com forward slash signals to danger. Last but not least, I gave Ben and his Steel Wheels podcast a bit of a shout out last time. Well, he's released his first round of episodes now, and I'm not ashamed to say I hammered my way through all three of them in one day. Released in threes, one episode covers the history of the railway, one covers a technological aspect, and the third, much like we do, covers when things go wrong. Available now is the fascinating history episode on the ancient Greek railway you probably didn't know anything about, I certainly didn't. Technology's first episode is part one of a number on the living, breathing machine that is the steam engine, and if you haven't had your fill after that, there's also an episode on the Norton Fitzwarren accident of 1940, which quite frankly is so good, I don't have to do it now. Each branch of the podcast has all of the hallmarks of being fantastically well researched, Ben's delivery clearly explains complex issues, and I personally found the whole experience very enjoyable. Cannot recommend it enough. Steel Wheels is available at Anchor, Pocket Casts and Spotify, although more and more locations are going to be coming available going forwards, just like we did here. Announcements out of the way. I would like to apologise for what might be a uh, croakier or snifflier voice. It's not the dreaded pandemic, but I'm a little bit under the weather this week. So let's get moving into today's episode. The sleeping train swayed to the left and right through the night as it powered down the country. Lights blurred past in the darkness, signs and signals unseen to those who lay sleeping in their beds. The last passengers to board over an hour ago had drifted off, trusting the man at the front of the train, sit and watch, to get them safely to their destination. But some carriages of this train didn't make it as far as Newcastle. Instead, they found themselves in the gardens of houses just next to the track. It's 1984, and we're visiting Morpeth. Investigators at the scene searched through the wreckage for the injured. At least 13 people are known to have died. Carriages are crushed, one on top of another. One lies metres away appears partially thing the railway industry is tonight coming to terms with yet another disaster this is signals to danger a podcast where we look at major rail disasters which have occurred in the uk explain what happened how the investigation was carried out and how each of these accidents shaped the industry going forwards i'm dan I work within the rail industry in my day-to-day life, but today I'll be the one taking you through this podcast. We'll start, as ever, by putting ourselves in the time of the incident. 
George Orwell's dystopian vision of 1984 hadn't quite come to fruition, although the year wasn't without its negative memories. In March, a year of industrial action began in the UK coal industry, and April saw the tragic death of WPC Yvonne Fletcher at the hands of a gunman from inside the Libyan embassy in London. It's not all bad news though, Bruce Springsteen released Born in the USA, his seventh studio album this year, June saw the release of Ghostbusters and Gremlin to the silver screen, and live entertainment is improved forever as the company Cirque du Soleil is founded in Canada. The back end of the year saw the Space Shuttle Discovery take its maiden voyage, and in a defining moment of the troubles, the provisional IRA attempted to assassinate Margaret Thatcher as they boldly planted a bomb in her hotel at the party conference in Brighton. But as much as actually happened in this year, what we need to focus on is June, specifically the 24th. Most episodes, we start our tale with a head code, the identifying number of the train involved. This week, no different. We're discussing 1 Echo 48. 217 metres long, the train consisted of seven sleeping carriages, top and tail by brake bands, and pulled along by a class 47 locomotive. It only ran on a Saturday, and it would allow for people to travel all the way from the North Sea oil town of Aberdeen to the capital of the UK, London. This train was one of British Rail's fleet of sleeper trains which ran at the time. In 2020, your choice of sleeper services within mainland Britain is restrictive to say the least. You have a grand choice of two options. If you want to venture from capital to Cornwall, you could take advantage of GWR's Night Riviera, and if the Highlands draw your desire, you can jump aboard the Caledonian sleeper from London up to Fort William, Aberdeen or Inverness. Both of these services now are looked on more as a romanticised reflection of the golden age of rail travel, something to start a holiday with, the journey to take, for the journey's sake. The modern day Caledonian is a standalone franchise, operated since 2015 by Serco, but it holds its heritage much further back. As early as 1873, the North British and Caledonian railways had attached sleeping cars onto mail trains, charging the princely sum of 10 shillings a berth. I think that's just about shy of £40 in new money. Sleeping services developed into specific trains, specific stock and nightly named services. They ran up and down the east and west coast main lines till 1988, when the east coast services were stopped. All of these routes, as stalwart, was the Aberdeen to London services. Between the years of 1927 and 1971, they had become known as the Aberdonian. Around an 11 hour journey when it was hauled by Deltic locomotives, this was a fairly popular service and although the name was dropped in 1971, the services continued onwards. One Echo 48 was in all but name, the Up Aberdonian, heading south to the capital. The first leg of the journey brought the train down from Aberdeen and to Edinburgh, the Scottish capital, where yet more passengers could board the train and make their way to England. The vast, sprawling Waverley station was free of much of the hustle and bustle of daytime, as Echo 48 sat in Platform 1. Here the train crew was to be relieved. A fresh guard and driver had met at the platform at 23.50 and after a brief chat they ascertained they were both booked on the same train. When it arrived, the guard, a W.G. Brown, headed to the brake van to collect his paperwork, while the driver, Peter Allen, wandered up the locomotive at the head of the train. The two would share a few extra words when Mr. Brown walked back up to the cab to confirm the consist and makeup of the train and the stopping pattern. The next scheduled call of the train was Newcastle, 80 miles to the south. Brown returned to his brake van at the rear, and at 23.05 the train departed and started southbound. This journey was uneventful, and Inspector Mr Simpson had also joined the train at Edinburgh, and he sat with Mr Brown for 10 minutes in the brake van, and then went into a vacant berth to fill out some paperwork. 
he remembered opening the blinds and seeing Tweedmouth, south of the border from Scotland into England. The inspector recounted how the journey hadn't felt unusual to him. Further south they travelled, deeper into Northumberland and in turn England. They passed Almouth, a traditional coastal resort just shy of 30 miles north of Newcastle, and continued on down. We've covered the route that this train was travelling on a few times on this podcast now. Yet again, we find ourselves on the East Coast Main Line. The main line from London King's Cross up to Edinburgh. We've talked previously about how the line is home to high permissible speeds and high speed trains as a result of various factors. As a general rule, the ECML is composed of relatively flat, gently curved track, at least double track throughout, quite often quad tracked where possible, and in later years, electrification throughout the whole route up to Edinburgh. The electrification of the line took place between 76 and 91. By 1984, the electrification hadn't gotten this far, so the acceleration and power to weight ratio benefits of the tractive power weren't available to the night sleeper on the 24th of June. Without electrification though, the line in general was still the fast one. This was where Mallard broke the steam speed record, It's where the Deltic routinely hauled express trains at 100 miles an hour, and after their retirement, the high speed train, or the Intercity 125, came to take up the route of the Flying Scotsman. All of this meant that the ECML regularly now saw passenger trains at 125 miles an hour. The factors which allow this speed are not to be found everywhere on the route though. There are places where topographical features and towns etc. dictate a route less flat and featureless. Places such as the Northumberland coast. Which brings us back to our journey. Mr Simpson sat in the vacant berth, filling out his check sheet and noting some locations passing by the window. He noted nothing unusual, no significant brake applications, until it all went drastically wrong. As the train passed Morpeth, He described himself as being held against the side of the coach by centrifugal force. That was until the carriage rolled over and everything came to a stand. A similar shock was experienced by passengers who had found themselves pitched from bunks and in a world turned around an axis. What was rapidly becoming certain is that everyone on the train knew that something had gone terribly wrong. It was abundantly clear as people found the doors of their compartments were now a feature of the floor or ceiling. Those who could used furniture as a ladder, then crawled along the narrow corridor to the doors at the end of the carriage. For most, no warning had come. The time was 0040, 20 to 1 in the morning. It certainly fits the bill of as good a time as any to be asleep. The only person who had any real warning was the guard, Mr Brown. He was reading a book in the brake van as the train approached Morpeth. When he saw the lights of the town approaching, he became acutely aware that the train was travelling faster than he expected it to be. He jumped out of his seat and he ran to the brakes in order to apply them to slow the train, but he never got there. He was thrown violently forwards instead. After the train came to a stand, the occupants of the train started to try and make good their escape. Mr Simpson, the inspector, was one of them. He was one of the individuals able to extricate themselves from the compartments and climb to the corridor which now ran along the top of the carriage. He managed to exit the coach by the doors at the end and found himself stood in somebody's garden, not in the ballast found under and to the side of the track. A local resident told him that the emergency services had already been called, so Mr Simpson assisted with the rescue. The guard, Mr Brown, was another member of the staff who managed to get himself out. He grabbed his lamp and climbed free of the brake van. He was met with the sight of people coming out of their houses adjacent to the line. He climbed the cutting and called to them to get in touch with the emergency services while he ran back to Morpeth Station to raise the alarm. Firefighters from both Morpeth and nearby Cramlington were on site between 10 and 15 minutes after the crash. What they found was a scene of devastation. To help understand the severity of this accident, I'll try to describe to you what they saw. 
Directly following Morpeth Station is Morpeth Curve, not unsurprisingly named for the notable curvature of the tracks. In fact, it's not just noteworthy. In the middle of what is otherwise a relatively fast section of line, Morpeth plays host to what is reputed to be the tightest curve of any mainline UK railway line. The radius is only 340 metres, or in railway parlance, 17 chains. As you're heading south, our train was on the left-hand set of rails, the up track towards London. The track starts to curve to the left as you reach the end of the platforms at Morpeth Station. The curve then continues round to the left, eventually turning around 98 degrees to the south. Just around a coach length off the end of the platforms, rescuers would find the rearmost vehicle, the brake van. It was derailed but upright on the tracks. Ahead of that was the rearmost sleeper car, also derailed and also upright. Forward of this, things started to look far worse, however. The next sleeper was on its right hand side, laid across both tracks, its front end all the way over to the opposite cess, the space at the very edge of the down running line. Both of its bogies, the frames holding the wheels, had been ripped clear of the carriage. In fact, the up track and cess ahead of this carriage was littered with bogies from various vehicles. The next two sleeping carriages lay almost in a straight line, end to end on their right hand sides. They led up the bank and into the garden of Aronsfield, a house on High Park Lane in Morpeth. When we move forwards to Coach E, it was also laid on its right hand side, however it was at a right angle to the three preceding. Its roof lay across the rear wall of Aronsfield, and the last few metres of the carriage were creased around the southeastern corner of the home. Coach F also lay atop the bank, but its leading end was no longer in the gardens of High Park Lane. It was embedded by around a third in the unused spare bedroom of a delightful timber-framed bungalow overlooking the cutting. All of the vehicles along the gardens and drives had been stripped of their bogies, and they remained down on the tracks. Now this accounts for virtually all of the vehicles of the train, barring three. The leading sleeping car, the locomotive and the brake van that sat between them. While five of the vehicles had taken a cross-country jaunt up the side of the embankment, these three stayed a little closer to home. The locomotive lay on its right hand side in the down cess, underneath where Aronsfield stood. This was the opposite side from where it had been travelling, meaning it had left the upline, crossed the down lines and ended up uprighted against the edge of the cutting. Significant damage was found to the down lines where the locomotive had crossed them. The leading brake van and sleeper car lay behind it, forming what was almost a letter V. The leading end of the brake van was next to the rear end of the loco, with its rear end in the upcess. This end sat below the leading end of the first sleeping car, whose trailing end had ended up in the cess of the down line. The brake van had been laid on its left hand side and the sleeping car on its right. This train was well and truly off the tracks, and one can only imagine what arriving rescuers were expecting to find in, on and under the wreckage. Sleeping cars are different from usual coaching stock in several ways, the most obvious being the internal layout. Your average passenger carriage in the 80s has moved to what we expect nowadays, open seating, normally 2x2 two two with a wide gangway in the middle of the train, access to and from the carriage from a vestibule at either end, and a wide gangway running right the way down the middle to connect them. One of the selling points of the sleeper service though, was that people could arrive at their destination well rested. This isn't likely to be achieved in an open carriage where people can brush past, make noise, wake you up, not to mention the issue, the issue of some little oik having at your belongings while you slumbered. For this reason, sleeper cars were designed differently. The beds were located in berths or compartments. 
each of these off a corridor which ran the length of the train. It solved the safety issue and it allowed for an undisturbed night's rest. Which sounds great until an accident like Morpeth occurs. The design of these carriages themselves created one major issue for rescuers as they arrived on the scene. To understand why, we need to briefly look at one of the main constraints on UK rolling stock designers, loading gauges. The UK loading gauge, the template that shows what space a train can fill based on the line side obstacles, is to say the least restrictive. You can picture this as a widthways outline of a rough train shape, and the outline of the shape is the maximum size a train can be to run within that gauge. It's true we have various different loading gauges around the country, depending on when lines were built, and a great variety of freight loading gauges. There are also some lines in the UK with some very generous European standards, but they are very far, very few in between. They're in places like High Speed 1, new build High Speed 2 will probably have the same. But the rub is that if the train you're building is to be used all over, then you need to build to the smallest template. So we won't get bogged down with it, we could easily spend a good 15 minutes on loading gauges. But what we need to understand is that the basic gauge for passenger stock gives you between 2.7 and 2.8 meters of width to play with. That's just under nine feet. In your normal train carriage, this is enough to give you a comfortable two by two seating and a corridor, or a gangway down the middle. However, some units even manage to get 3 by 2 But that's not the aim of a sleeper carriage. 2.8 metres is not a lot of space to try and put beds and compartments where people can lie down and sleep comfortably and leave room for a corridor along the train. When all is said and done, bigger compartments are more marketable, more luxurious and sell better. So the corridors on sleeper cars are very narrow just about wide enough for someone to walk along. Passing is so difficult that it was more realistic just to wait at the end of the carriage to pass. Generally speaking, this isn't much of an issue. Until these carriages are on their side. Three of the sleeper cars on their sides had the compartment windows skywards, so extrication of injured and trapped passengers from these carriages was relatively easy. But coaches G, E and C with the other way around. The compartment windows were faced down into the grass or ballast. What this meant was that while firefighters were able to break the windows in the roof of the carriage, this allowed them access not into the compartments where people had been sleeping and were now trapped, but rather into the corridor. There's a photograph in the report which illustrates this problem. Firefighters found themselves in what was now nothing more than an 18 inch high space. They struggled to use crowbars in such a confined location and they were unable to cut through the roofs of the carriages with the gear that they had available. This invariably delayed the recovery of some of the people trapped within the carriages. If we move down to the front of the train, in the cab of a locomotive which now lay on its side, we find driver Peter Allen. As the loco had tipped and slid along the ground, he had been thrown from his seat and into the opposite side of the cab, the second man's side. Firemen and a doctor entered through the cab window where it was broken on the second man's side. Driver Allen was examined briefly before being taken out and placed on a stretcher. Amongst all of this chaos and destruction, it was necessary to take stock of the cost of the disaster. For those arriving on scene, and those involved in rescue efforts, it seemed almost certain that this derailment on Morpeth Curve would have resulted in a loss of life. Which is why everyone was so surprised when it didn't. Believe it or not, the death toll of the 1984 Morpeth crash was zero. 29 passengers and 6 crew were taken to hospital, but everyone, barring driver Allen and two sleeping car attendants, were discharged after a treatment. The physical damage to the infrastructure was extensive, but somehow it 
didn't come hand in hand with the expected human cost. BBC News report the following morning described how rescuers and railway engineers called it the miracle at Morpeth. As each passenger was brought out alive, it felt more and more so. The rescue and recovery stage was complete, and so once again the railway inspectorate found themselves investigating the causes of a UK rail disaster. Her Majesty's Rail Inspectorate, under the leadership of Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Townsend, worked in conjunction with the police to ascertain the reasons this accident had occurred. As ever, there are a number of questions which needed answering by the investigators. First and foremost, what had led to the midnight sleeper leaving the tracks at Morpeth? What was the immediate cause? And were there any underlying causes which had directly led to the immediate cause? Any causal factors? You'll notice how I got that right this time. Finally, had any opportunities to prevent the accident taking place been missed? Once again, we find ourselves revisiting the comments that I made during the Potter's Bar episode. Derailments tend not to happen where tracks are straight and level. I made points then about how the majority of derailments occur where there are junctions or excessive curves, and I believe we've already ascertained that a great deal of curvature was present at Morpeth, in fact probably the very definition of curvature. Corners in and of themselves do not lead to accidents. If this was the case, the network would be very restrictive, lots of straight lines and vastly increased tunnelling and bridging costs, cuttings and embankments absolutely everywhere, including some parts of the country we just wouldn't go. No, it's not feasible at all. We use corners and we manage the risks that they introduce. This is done through some very careful balancing of physics, increasing the fastest speed trains can travel through the corner by introducing features which keep trains on the rails. The first and most common of these is cant. Cant helps a train steer around a curve, keeping the wheel flanges from touching the rails, minimising friction and wear. The way they set it up essentially creates a banked turn, with the outside rail higher than the inside one, tilting the train into the corner, neutralising the lateral forces which would push a cornering train over the outside rail and into derailment. This has to be balanced around the types of trains using the line. If you want a high speed passenger train to use it, then it needs to tilt more. But if you need slower, heavier freight trains to pass by, then the tilt can't be too great or trains will tilt and fall over into the corner. If we look to modern times, we have class 390 Pendolinos on the West Coast Main Line, operated by Avanti, although for a long time they were adorned with the logo of Branson's Virgin Trains. These use an active tilting system that can tilt cars individually into the corner to better manage the forces experienced and artificially increase the cant. Once you've exhausted the speed gains you can make from these external factors, that's when you're left with your maximum permissible speed for the corner. Going to Morpeth in 1984, only one of those two controls was available. BR was still trialling the advanced passenger train on the west coast at this point and its active tilting wasn't yet a common feature of rolling stock, let alone Mark III sleeping cars. So Kant was the answer to increasing the permissible speed at Morpeth. Up until the 30th of December 1977, the speed around the curve southbound had been 40 miles an hour, but at that point, the Kant had been increased from 114 millimeters to 150, which allowed for an increase to 50 miles an hour. Any further tilting would result in slower trains being at risk on the curve, and so the permanent speed restriction for the corner was set at 50. The long and short is that the curve of the corner wasn't to blame for the accident. It was tighter than most mainline locations, but it was managed. In which case, the most likely answer is that the train may have been travelling in excess of the 50 mile an hour limitation on the curve. To understand the feasibility of this answer, 
we need to look at several different sources of information. Firstly, we'll look at eyewitness accounts, one of the most reliable sources we've already discussed, the guard on the train, Mr. Brown. As the train approached Morpeth, he'd become aware of the speed, and he was concerned enough about it that he jumped out of his chair to apply the brakes. Too little, too late though. Some of the passengers as well had complained of the ride quality. In particular, there was a Mr. Mark Barker, who was the marketing manager of Commonwealth Games Organisation. He was a regular traveller, and he was concerned at the movement of the coach, which he described as pitching and rolling unusually for some 20 minutes prior to the accident, and his body was sliding up and down in his bed, he says his hat also slid along the rack above his head. There was a track worker, a Mr. Brewis, who was working around about six miles in advance of Morpeth on the closed down line due to engineering works. He saw the train approaching as he worked, sounded his warning siren and received a warning horn in return from driver Allen. He didn't testify to any specific speed as part of that, but the train was there and it was alert. As useful as these accounts may be, particularly the experienced and competent account of Conductor Brown. The best evidence will always come from physical proof. Much in the same way as at Hatfield, physical marks and damage to the track would prove instrumental. Mr McLaughlin, the principal scientific officer at British Rails Board, was called to attend the derailment, and he arrived there shortly after 8.30 in the morning. He was incredibly experienced in the study of derailments. The actual point of the derailment was ascertained by the marks caused by the wheels lifting over the right hand rail. At least five derailing marks were noted over the next 19 sleepers on the right hand rail. One point of note was that there were no marks on the left hand running rail, which indicated that the wheels had just been lifted clear of it. The whole train must have been tilting over to the right at the point that derailment occurred. In fact, Mr McLaughlin noticed a flat spot on the gauge corner, the corner of the railhead, which lasted for 21 metres prior to the point of derailment, which indicates that the train had been running with an inclined axle and left hand wheels clear before it jumped fully clear of the rails. There were damage marks to the concrete sleeper ends of the down line which began 15 metres beyond, and 8 metres after this there was blue paint on the 6 foot rail of the down line, which indicated that a coach was on its side at this point. There were wheel marks on the check rail of the upline, which showed that train wheels had run derailed on the sleepers in the forefoot. He considered these to be made by the last sleeping car on the train which remained upright with the brake band behind it. Now, all of this evidence observed told investigators that the train had overturned quite quickly, beginning at a point some 18 metres from the top of the platform ramp, and the wheels had derailed some 23 metres further on. They understood that the first coaches to overturn were the first and second sleeping cars, which had then separated from each other. It was thought that the leading sleeping car and the van ahead of it had caused the locomotive to overturn very soon afterwards and to cross the downline, causing serious damage to it, and the fact that all of the bogies from the rear half of the train had been discarded by their overturning coaches supported the view of this fast overturning. While the understanding was crucial, what actually would come down to would be some very talented maths. This is what would prove that speeding was responsible for the accident at Morpeth. Mr McLaughlin presented calculations carried out by his team. The calculations were based on an er so I'm reading this from the report. The calculations were based on an iterative process which considered ever increasing lateral centrifugal force which drove the vehicle body over onto its bump stops and the primary and secondary suspensions onto theirs until the inside wheels were completely unloaded. Which is an incredibly wordy way of saying they looked at the forces needed, increasing forces needed to tilt the body of the train over to the outside as it moved into the corner until the suspension and other components could tilt no more and the left hand wheels lifted free of the track. It was ascertained 
that the speeds at which this occurs, based on the track geometry at Morpeth, was between 85 and 91 miles an hour. This was on a curve renowned for its tightness with a 50 mile an hour speed limit. The cause of the derailment was without the shadow of a doubt, speeding. In fact, you could call the blunt immediate cause as being the train derailed due to traveling at a speed in excess of the limitations of the corner. So the story gets really interesting when we start looking at the second question. Were there any underlying factors, any causal factors that led to the train attempting to negotiate the corner between 35 and 40 mile an hour over the limit? One by one, the Lieutenant Colonel and his team ticked off a list of potential factors which could have contributed to the accident. Signalling. They were satisfied that the signalman had set the route for the train, that the signals were all at green, and that signalling played no part in the accident. The condition of the track. Although it was heavily damaged in the course of the accident, the point of derailment was easily identified, and they were also satisfied that track on approach to it, and a little way beyond, was in good condition. So braking systems. The guard's evidence concerning the brake gauge readings, the thorough examination of the air pipes throughout, and the braking equipment on the locomotive, all of that indicated that the brakes were in working order. The locomotive controls indicated that no brake application had been made, or even as a final emergency measure if not on the approach. Trackman Brewis's evidence that showed that the driver was alert because he sounded his horn some six miles or four minutes north of Morpeth. This satisfied the lieutenant that driver Allen was alert, so he couldn't have been mistaken about his whereabouts on the approach to Morpeth. The marks on the rails and the final positions of the coaches and bogies indicated without a doubt that the coaches overturned on the bend. Calculations had showed that the train's probable speed was between 85 and 91 mile an hour and the maximum speed was 50. From the signal box passing times looked at as part of the investigation, it seemed that the train was being driven at between 60 to 70 miles an hour and had probably begun accelerating some 12 miles from Morpeth to get to that overturning speed. So, it was therefore concluded that driver Allen failed to reduce his train's speed before entering the curve at Morpeth. The investigation, understandably, swung around to him, placing him firmly in the spotlight. In fact, this has actually begun in the early stages. Due diligence meant that police had started checking on his condition from the very beginning. Dr Gardner, a police surgeon of Newcastle, visited Allen at 0355 in hospital. Alan said that he remembered passing Berwick and Armouth, but nothing further. At that point, Dr. Gardner observed that Alan smelt of alcohol. Alan admitted then to Inspector Guthrie, who had accompanied the doctor, that he had taken a drink before joining his train. The next morning, Alan was interviewed again, and his movements prior to taking the train were questioned in further detail. He recounted that he had signed on duty at Haymarket Depot at 21.43 on the evening of Saturday the 23rd of June. He had then driven his car down to Waverley Station, parked in his car, and after drinking two cans of Tenant's Lager in the car park, had walked around the station until his train arrived, which he boarded at about 22.50. Now in this interview, he also raised that he had had bronchitis for 20 years and that he regularly suffered from coughing fits. He told the police that he thought he had had a small coughing fit at Berwick, he took medicines for it as necessary and he said that he once suffered a blackout, about 18 months earlier, from coughing. And on that occasion it had been a small coughing fit which made him pass out for just a second. The police gave it another two weeks and Alan was interviewed again at home. His movements were further questioned. He said that he'd left home on the night of the accident at around about 10 to 9 in his car. He stopped at a public house in Musselburgh where he drank, on his own, a whisky followed by a pint of lager. He then left the public house, around about 20 past 9. He arrived at Waverley, around about 25 to 10, and he entered the East End Shunters Bothy. He telephoned Haymarket Depot to sign on, 
He then collected two further cans of lager from his car and drank them on his own in the bothy. During this interview, he said that he did not normally drink before driving a train, nor while on duty, and he wasn't a heavy drinker. But he could suggest no reason why he'd done so on that occasion. He admitted that he knew it was an offence under BR rules to be intoxicated on duty. There were a couple of key questions that were asked in this interview. Surely, as you have admitted, being an infrequent and light drinker, the quantity of your alcoholic intake on that night was way above normal. The response, I have to say yes. And consequently, your driving ability therefore was likely to have been impaired. It could have been. All of this is what led to the driver, Peter Allen, facing charges in court. Three courts, in, three counts, sorry, in fact, damaging property with intent, endangering the safety of passengers by a lawful act, and endangering the safety of passengers by willful omission. This was finally brought down to just the one count of endangering the safety of passengers by willful omission, but I certainly know what my thoughts, and the thoughts of many people involved in the investigation, would lead us to take as the main reason. I firmly believe the intoxication of driver Allen led to him being in an unfit state to control his train correctly. In fact, the account of his whereabouts puts him in close proximity to open public houses for about an hour of unaccounted for time at Waverley, so there's a reasonable probability that he actually had even more to drink that nobody ever found out about. If 20 minutes in the pub at Musselburgh got him a whiskey and a Foster's, I don't know what he could have had in 55 minutes in a pub just next to Waverley Station. However, for one reason or another, and speculation aside, he was found not guilty. This is quite possibly the direct result of an ambush defence by Allen's legal team. At the last minute, they provided medical evidence in the form of expert testimony, which suggested that at times the driver may pass out based around his bronchitis. The prosecution, not having prior knowledge of this evidence, were unable to rebuke it. Alan was acquitted. It's clear on the Lieutenant Colonel's opinion on the matter though. I'll read the following directly from his conclusion. Driver Alan had clearly failed to properly control his train. There was two possible reasons for this. That he suffered a severe bout of coughing shortly before he should have begun to reduce the train's speed, and remained incapable until the train overturned. It seems that Driver Allen had never reported to the railway medical officers the fact that he suffered from an incapacitating coughing condition. In any case, he had only to take his feet off the DSD pedal to stop the train if he had begun to cough uncontrollably, and he could also have shut off power and applied the brakes very quickly. Alternatively, it is possible that he became drowsy and inattentive because of the drink he had taken. In the last six miles approaching Morpeth at some 80 mile an hour or more, he may have fallen asleep or become so drowsy that he completely forgot about the approaching curve. I must say that I am strongly inclined to the possibility that he fell fully or nearly asleep as being the most likely. All of which neatly brings us to the question of missed opportunities. And yes, like most times we've asked this question, the sad truth is that there are certainly some missed opportunities, and one of them far more ironic than anyone cared to admit. The first, though, carries some resemblance to the issues we saw at Cannon Street Station some years later. The fact that Driver Allen was allowed to book on for duty over the telephone from Waverley, instead of actually going in person to his depot at Haymarket, and taking the company minibus through to Waverley Station meant that the industry was robbed of the opportunity to physically look upon him and check that he was fit for duty. To sign on with a supervisor, they could have smelt something on his breath if they had been there to smell, they could have seen fatigue, clues in people's... It could have been caught. The people on the train could have been saved the terrifying experience they underwent if somebody had looked at him prior to him taking the train that day. But that's not the biggest missed opportunity. 
not the one that would probably have people kicking themselves. If we go back to 1969, a passenger train had derailed on a corner with a reduced speed from the running of the rest of the line. It was recommended that an outcome of that investigation that the automated warning system, AWS, used at fixed signals be further rolled out to assist with certain permanent speed restrictions. This would mean that although drivers should be acutely aware of all of the speeds in their route knowledge, they would receive visual prompt from signage as well as an audible and visual notification inside the cab from the AWS equipment. This should serve to eliminate or at least severely reduce the likelihood of these sorts of incidents. The train that derailed on the 7th of May 1969 was the Down Abedonian Sleeper, from London to Edinburgh. The curve that it derailed on, Morpeth. In fact, the signs of warning of restrictions had been given a nickname, Morpeth Boards. The irony here was in the application of the rules. It stated that where the speed limit drops by a third, a sign an AWS magnet should be provided. Southbound, from Berwick to Armouth to Morpeth, the limit drops by 50%, from 100 mile an hour at one point to 50 mile an hour on the curve. But it's staggered. The reduction actually takes place over three separate restrictions, first to 80, then to 70, then to 50. None of those restrictions in the Cascade qualified for a Morpeth board. It just didn't qualify. The curve at Morpeth didn't get a Morpeth board. If one had been fitted and Alan was incapacitated either through coughing or drink, he would not have reacted to the AWS alert, the brakes would automatically have been applied, the derailment would have been avoided. The legacy of Morpeth covers several factors. The notoriety of the corner only increased, and I would love to tell you that it never again had its tracks darkened by disaster. But sadly that's just not quite true. In 1992, two freight trains collided due to a misunderstanding, and this led to a tragic fatality. And would you believe it? In 1994, an express parcel train overturned, travelling at 80 miles an hour through the curve. While AWS equipment was fitted to many permanent speed restrictions as part of the equipment associated with Morpeth boards, there were still locations, such as Morpeth itself, where the cascading led to missed opportunities. Following the 1984 accident, the rules were amended to take account of serious restrictions of speed when that cascading occurs. In general, each restriction must be considered as if it were from the initial approaching speed. If the initial speed was over 75, and the restriction greater than a third of that, a board would be provided. Another system also supplemented the protection afforded by AWS in the years going forward. We've briefly discussed it before, but TPWS, Train Protection and Warning System, can be used to provide overspeed protection, as well as signal protection. The loops of the system can be placed in such a way that on the approach to a speed restriction, the system will automatically apply the brakes on a train if it's travelling too fast to be down to the new limit in time. The system was rolled out at various locations around the network from trials that started in 1997 and it really took to the tracks in the early 2000s. It was always meant to be a bit of a stopgap and looked upon as a cheaper alternative to some other systems such as automatic train control but it's quite flexible and it sees use up until now in a variety of situations where approaching X too fast will mean bad things happen. Normally, this is the point in the episode where I would wind up and talk about the memorial to the accident, poignantly reflect on the loss of life and perhaps discuss trauma caused by those who responded. But this is the first accident we've covered where nobody died. It's not the last, certainly. There are many significant accidents where loss of life wasn't part of it. But it's the first one. The relatively new Mark III coaching stock certainly saved lives. And the emergency services on the day 
couldn't believe that they didn't need to lift out a single body. But we need to remember that, lucky though people were, the fact that this accident occurred wasn't due to chance or fate or something else as vague. It was the result of a combination of factors. Some of them were institutional, a booking on process that was flawed, a snag of a rule which meant Morpeth boards didn't belong at Morpeth. But make no mistake, the root cause, in my mind at least, is the reckless treatment of his charge by a driver who either drank too much at an irresponsible time, or failed to be open about an incapacitating illness which should have rendered him unable to safely carry out his role. Whether he was guilty in court or not, the blame for Morpeth lies firmly at the front door of Peter Allen. Thanks again for tuning in and listening to me banging on about disasters. As ever, I appreciate every single one of you. Please like, share, review, come interact with us on social media. Twitter, Facebook, just search for Signals to Danger. Go to signalstodanger.com. If you are interested in supporting us, go and have a look at the Patreon. It's patreon.com signals to danger. Lastly, the music from this episode was Light Goes Away by Douglas Maxwell, Deserted City, Warm of Mechanical Heart, Difference, Sunset and Brand New World by Kai Engel, and Merkabar by Jesse Gallagher. Thanks again, until next time, travel safe.